So, um, yes, I'm uh, Thomas Grip. I'm creator director at Frictional Games, and I'm going to be talking about how to make a story that you can play. Um, as Matthew said, I've been uh, working on horror game now for the last uh, 15 years or so, which is a long time, which, uh, I don't know, makes me a weird person perhaps. Um, I'm part of the, the making the Penumbra series of games. Anyone played Penumbra? Woo! <laughs> um, and also the Amnesia series. Anyone played that? Just heard about it? Anyone played it? A bit more? Okay, that's good. Um, so, and uh, making these horror games has dragged me into the problem of how to make interactive storytelling. And that might seem a bit weird at first because you don't think about uh, horror games as narrative uh, games as such. You normally think of genres like classic point and click adventures. Oh, that's uh, um, where the story games are. But I feel that horror games is even more narrative games than uh, those sort of things. Uh, and the first reason for this is that horror games is a genre based on evoking a certain emotion. When you're playing a game from another genre, you're expecting a certain kind of gameplay. But when you're playing a horror game, you expect to be frightened. There is no real thinking that, oh, I'm going to play it like this. So if you compare like Five Nights at Freddy's with Silent Hill, it's very different mechanics that build up that uh, sort of game. And when you're developing a horror game, you think of a much higher level than you normally do and think about the start out with the mechanics but you think about what sort of feelings and emotions you want to do and uh, when you work at this sort of higher level that's where um, more of the storytelling comes in which i'm going to get to a little bit later on another thing that's uh, special about horror games is that representation and imagination plays a vital role in making these games so in the sort of abstract representation that's working the sim how the simulation is working it can just be a cylinder that's uh, chasing the player around but if you represent that as a cardboard box or you know a drooling <laughs> scary monster that makes all the difference for how the final experience will be if you make a first person shooter you can make a full game that's all about cylinders and boxes and those sort of thing and you can get the bulk of the gameplay done for a horror game you need to have the representations ready in order to figure out is this game working or is it, is it not working and when you get this sort of thing working something sort of magical happens and it amazes me how easy this is this is a screenshot from slender anyone played slender or know about it at least. So Slender is uh, a pretty simple game. You, you just throw the player into a dark, a dark place with the flashlights, play some spooky sounds, and I mean the assets are, you know, sort of crappy. But <laughs> but the atmosphere, it's it's like really really thick, and and it it comes so easily. It it it, it you, you don't have to put that much effort for that to happen. And compared to making the same atmosphere come alive from a film or a book then you have to put down so much more work and i'm going to show a bit what what happens now you most of you heard of amnesia but i'm going to show it anyway um what happens when you when you make this sort of thing work hey children shut up no you're gonna like what i've got now i don't like it shut up oh this sounds like you're battling with a gas engine i've got me here Oh shit! <laughs> oh fuck. Oh shit, I can see the thing! I can see it! Oh no, 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 it's coming! It's coming! Ah! Ah! No! <laughs>
I don't know if it makes me a bit depraved, I just love seeing stuff like that. Um, but um, it, it's sort of, I mean, people don't sit at home screaming like that, but that sort of reaction, um, it, it's not like unusual. A lot of players get that from the game. And there's just something about video games that immerses people in that way, which I'm also going to get to a, a bit uh, later on, that's very special. And it, it's not just Amnesia that does this, there's tons of games that does this. You have a recent example at Outlast in Alien Isolation, D they also work uh, this way yeah? and uh, create these really powerful emotions. And I feel that the sort of primal horror emotions that are awoken from playing games like this, like top anything that you can have in, in books or movies. But the issue is that it's pretty much restricted to very primal sort of horror. Um, if you were to do a, a video game based on something like The Exorcist or Rosemary's Baby, you can't just rely on a flight or fight response. You'd have to do something else. In order to do that with this sort of level of immersion, you'd have to figure out how do we get the player like in that sort of state and still tell a story on that. And trying to have these sort of deep horror, that's a call, it's like deeper, I mean, the exorcist is a bit deeper than your, your average sort of run from the monster thing. Um, and having that with this sort of immersion, but with a deeper story, that's sort of my design goal at this point, trying to get that uh, working in some manner. And I also think that answering the question on how to do this is going to like unlock uh, the foundational basics of how to do really, really good interactive storytelling. I think they're, those are very tightly connected to one another. So um, th that's what sort of my talk is going to be about now. How do we do this? And before um, we get to the sort of UC parts, we need to discuss a bit what is uh, narrative, what is a story. The normal way to think about the story is to think about it as a sequence of events. So, oh, she did that, then she did that, then they met, and then they went there, yada, 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 etc., etc. And this sort of view has been used in the past to argue that video games can't tell stories. And the argument goes something like this. So, a video game relies on a certain degree of freedom from the player, but a story, that's about having a events happening in a very specific way at a specific time, these contradict one another, thus stories in games just cannot happen. But I feel that viewing stories like just a sequence of events, it, it's super unhelpful and it's, to be honest, a little bit naive. First off, if we just think about how stories come to be, they always start with a sort of core idea, not with a sequence of events, but a sort of premise. And then you just see, oh, let's see what happens next. You just go with the flow, write the characters, see what they're doing right now. That's how writers um, write their stories. And also, if you ever have told like a, a joke or told a story, you know that there are a specific set of stuff that you need to hit in order to get the story across. Sometimes Sometimes those are very specific, specific events, other times it could be character traits, it can be a setting, it can be like a vague sense of how, how a scenario should act out. Um, so from, I think that it's much, much better to think about story as a sort of container word for a lot of other elements. And these elements are are these five things. Um, first of all, you have theme. These are the sort of high level concepts uh, that you're gonna work with. Um, this will be a story about betrayal. This is gonna show how capitalism is evil. Yeah, I don't know, it's stuff like that. Um, then you have setting. This is where does it take, where does it take place? When does it take place? Um, what sort of weather conditions are there? What is the lore? What is the background story? So forth. Then you have characters. These are the beings in your story that do stuff. And and it, the dialogue and stuff like that is contained here too. And then you have the plot as a sort of sub-element of the story. It's not what the story is, it's just part of what uh, can be inside a story. And then you can have a very specific uh, chain of events that need to happen, but they can be like branching, they can be spread out, it can just be one or two events that uh, are sort of crucial to happen in the story. Finally, you have narration, which is how is the story told? Is this an unreliable narrator? Is it uh, told in chronological order or whatever? 
um, that sort of stuff. For games, you can even talk about narration as, oh, it uses audio logs and, and that sort of stuff. Uh, and I feel that this sort of... Uh, Viewing story like that, this helps a ton, and you're gonna see. Hopefully, you're gonna see that it it makes a lot of sense. First of all, if we choose to define storytelling, it makes perfect sense. It's telling the story somehow. It's just getting your story elements across to the audience in some manner. And any video game that tries to do this is a game about storytelling. So, Final Fantasy game about storytelling. Tetris. Not so much a game about storytelling. It makes intuitive sense. There, there's nothing weird about it. It's very easy to talk about, and it sort of it aligns with our preconceptions pretty well. Next up is another word, gonna be a little bit trickier to get across, but it's super, 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 super uh, critical. This is narrative. Normal, in normal, when we talk normally, we see narrative as pretty much the exact same thing as story, but. I like to think of it as the subjective experience um, of, of uh, the audience when being told um, a, a storyline. Um, and I think that the, this is a sort of important part because in video games, you, you can, as we see, you're not told the story in a sort of sequenced event. You, you, you know, for instance, in Gone Home, um, the narrative would be, oh, my narrative is like this when I look in the, uh, look in the drawers, etc., read the notes. You, it's going to be very different for different people. But if we all here read the same book, watch the same movie, the narrative that we go home with if we start discussing it is going to be very similar to all people. So, so um, it's gonna, we're going to feel like it's, oh, story, that's a sequence of events. And therefore, I feel because of this, many people think that story is something that is very uh, plotted. But it's basically as a as constraint of the medium. There are some films and books that are not the sequence of events, but they're where They're more, more like the exception that makes the rule sort of thing. So uh, very important, I think, to, to feel uh, of, of narrative in, in this way. And, and another thing also that with this is that when you talk about in movies about plot, you talk about narrative, you talk about story, it doesn't really matter if you confuse them. You can still like have a conversation about it, but in games, it, it becomes much more we weird if you just, oh, stories, the plot, and so on and so forth. So therefore, I think it's very important that our terminology is uh, aligned correctly. So how does a narrative arise from a video game? And here is a sort of simple diagram of uh, how it works. First of all, you have at the lowest level you have the mechanics and the mechanics is in the game is something like okay um uh, the, the little mustache guy he hits a block and up pops a mushroom and in, in another game it can be okay shoot me to a rifle at a bad guy he takes damage that's the mechanics then at another level you have the dynamics or the tactics and in and in some games it could be oh i need to get that mushroom but there's a goomba coming at me i need to jump over and jump uh, jump at him how am i going to combine all that into something um where i do not die um or in another game it can be oh if i lob a grenade here that's going to kill those bad guys then i can sneak back and shoot the others in the back that's sort of how you build you build from the underlying mechanics and then narrative it's building on the dynamics so in one game it can be oh i went through uh, some rough times but uh, then when I got to the castle the princess just he, she wasn't there she was in another one um, and uh, <laughs> and in some other game it can be oh I kill all the hostiles and freed the village uh, sort of thing now we come to, to this so, so the big problem though in game design is that you basically just focus on the first two levels you focus on getting good mechanics getting good dynamics and then the narrative it's sort of like a waste product that just comes out of this so what are we going to do about this oh well, we have a game where we like shoot people and what sort of narrative can we like do, use to justify that we just throw something at it and 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 that's basically how most sort of narratives uh, come to be um, unfortunately, there, there's there's no one who wants who thinks about narrative as much as think about dynamics and. Uh uh, the mechanics. And so hopefully um, I sort of convinced you now that narrative is, is more than your story. And now I just want to show you a bit of uh, how subtle uh, this sort of narrative uh, comes to be in games. So I'm going to give examples from two different games. 
Um, one is Limbo and the other is Badland. These games, they're, they're pretty, at, at the surface, they're pretty similar. So Limbo, uh, um, both of them have the same sort of artistic style. They're both about going through this sort of obstacle courses. And I think they're done by uh, Danish people, both of them too. Um, <laughs> not that it matters that much, but um, uh, there, there might be some underlying attention there. Um, <clears throat> So, so never mind. Um, next up, so, so first off, we have Badland. So in Badland, you start out as this sort of hairy ball, and you go through these uh, sort of uh, obstacle courses, and you, you come across these sort of giant cogwheels, and then we have a windmill, and then he splits up. Uh, and it, there's stuff in the background, but I'm not sure what it is. Um, and and, and Lots and lots and lots of stuff happens in this game, but it makes no narrative sense. I can't like tell you the story of how I played Badland. Um, it, it, there, there's no such story to tell. Whereas in Limbo, I wake up in a forest. I'm not sure where I where I am. I'm. You can even go. Limbo has tons of sort of small stuff. I'm. Um, it, it's called Limbo, so apparently I might be in Limbo. Uh, um, so, so you can sort of draw conclusions from that. Then there's this wooden structure that I climb. I climbed on my rope. Oh, there's a boat. I'm gonna take a trip with the boat. Oh no, there's a nasty spider. The, the spider hunts me. And then there's traps all over the place. Who's, who put those traps out there? Then you meet the people that put the traps out there. And there are tons of story in, uh, in, in Limbo. Um, but, but people never talk about Limbo as a story game. So I've heard, heard them saying something, oh, it's sort of like, you know, it's sort of ambient. There's no good vocabulary where Limbo fits in as a story game if you choose to have story as just, you know, a sequence, a, a plotted event or the normal sort of things we think about uh, um, as a, as a story, um, and it's uh, and it's uh, really uh, I think it, uh, it it's a big hurdle with, with the doing storytelling if we don't uh, can see that Limbo really is a game about storytelling. And just a quick anecdote um, about it because I, I met uh, like three four years ago Ant, so is the sort of lead designer who, who like came up with this uh, this subject <laughs> the, the story, and 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 I, and I asked him I was trying out the, actually their, their new game um, we one of the first who did that um, and and I asked him so in your new game um, is there gonna be a story <laughs> and he just looks at me like limbo had a story <laughs> and, and so now now I'm sort of making up for it you I understand you aunt I understand you so yeah you're right all along it was me who was the idiot I'm, I'm very sorry um, <clears throat> So now that we know what narrative and story is, uh, we need to talk a little about why stories work. And it's super weird, really. When you read a book, you, you like, read some, here's some sort of symbols, and I parse them into, into different things. And, and, and you, you mean, if, if, if you haven't read a book and I told you about this, you would leave, there could be no experience coming from that. But after you've read a book, at least a good one, you've taken a journey someplace, you've visited another place, and it can be a really powerful experience. And that's just from parsing a few letters. Um, here's another, here's a sort of good example. So this sentence, the building was on fire and it wasn't my fault. Um, I mean, if in my head, like images just pop up, but okay, what sort of world is this where buildings catch fire from fr time to time? And oh, it wasn't my fault. That tells you a lot about the main character and stuff like that. It, it really just uh, builds up from the negative space presented here. You start directly to build up an, a, a world from it. And it's really, really powerful. And our brains, they're, they're just soaking up. They want to make a story out of everything they, they can come across. Um, Here's a movie from um, um, 1944. It's a, it's a psychology ex experiment uh, um, where they show just how um, how our brains just want to make story out of everything. Yeah. I mean, even though this is just, you know, like uh, <laughs> triangles and a circle, you instantly start giving them human traits, like motivations. And that little thing there, you know, the rectangle, it, it starts becoming some sort of object. Perhaps it's a house or something like that.
is weird, right? You mean it's just it's just simple geometrical forms, and instantly we there's a story. I mean, if you talk about it afterwards, it would be interesting to just hear to talk among each other what sort of story you got out out from that. Uh, what, what was the motivation from the big uh, uh, triangle and stuff like that? Um, so, um, so, 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 so obviously we have with books and, and with film that uh, there, there is a certain, uh, you know, fantasy created from it, but it feels like it's, it's a little bit different with games. In, in a movie, you can have like a guy uh, shooting a rocket and then in another frame, a car explodes and we connect that in our minds to a, a sequence of events that that sort of make uh, make a coherent whole out of that but in a game there's actually like an actual rocket is fired from an actual there's an underlying simulation that calculates the trajectory of the missile and then it hits its target and the target is destroyed and uh, and in some way th this sort of uh, it's much more this sort of happening is much much more re real in a game than it is in a movie there's, there's something that's uh, that actually happens there and i think that this also has caused some sort of confusion in in how the, the video game medium um differentiates from other medium in that oh in in um, in, in in movies and in books, you're all about trying to evaluate and trying to interpret the events. But in a video game, you're just reacting uh, to the happenings that are sort of already there. And I think that uh, that that is something also that uh, oh, you can't tell stories with only reactions. But the thing is that video games really have a sort of fantasy and uh, and interpretation going. When you're playing a game, you're not playing with the abstract objects on the screen you're playing a game inside your own head where you sort of make your own imaginations uh, uh, imagination from what's happening on the screen so I'm gonna give a little simple example here so say that you want to traverse um, a hallway in a um, not what hallway but but it, it traverses a hallway in, in a room so you, what you don't do is that you don't go like if there are walls here you are you don't <laughs> you don't like go bump back and forth between the walls and trying to oh, I'm just gonna see where the, <laughs> the limits of the simulation here you, you don't do something like that what you do instead is that you use your knowledge of the real world and and your sort of intuitive sense of how the underlying simulation is and auditory and visual cues and you plan a path and then afterwards you execute that plan in walking a specific route where you do not bump into the wall like a maniac my father plays games like the first though uh, but yeah <laughs> I think it's a stage <laughs> um, it's a phase um, so um, what what's what this is sort of trivial though when I say it's like of course I plan a path like that's obviously but the sort of weird thing is though that that unless you bump into the walls or or, or even even more so unless something happens that contradicts it contradicts how you feel it all should work then you're really playing the game in your head all of the time you, you're like playing an imaginary game and it's just the, the 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 game the game simulation just gives you feedback from time to time and what this is called it's a mind model what you're doing in your head like based on on what's happening in game is is is, is a mind model and Brian Upton from Santa Monica Studios has a really great example of uh, this at work because it's, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. And uh, in, in the 1998 uh, game uh, Rainbow Six, which he uh, directed, the player is really, really one vulnerable. So the player dies from just one shot. So you have to be really cautious when uh, traversing the environment. And you're constantly like on the lookout for, uh, um, for hostiles. Um, so when you're when you try to enter a new room or something uh, or something like that, you you, you need to figure out. Where, where can the hostiles be? Can you be like hiding behind the wall there? Perhaps I should like set up the fence there and stuff like that. So what's happening is that even though the world is very simplistic, you get tons of gameplay from it. And that without the player even playing, they're just sitting there thinking about different scenarios, playing them out in their head and then execute them after a bit. But they're playing an imaginary game for a very huge large chunk of the game and and it's a core thing of the experience and 
Another thing that, yes, so this sort of mental modeling, it happens in other media too. It's like when I said, I showed you the quote, that's also sort of mental modeling, but it's much, much stronger in games because your, how your mo mental model is can affect the actual outcome of your actions later on. Like in Rainbow Six, how good you are at planning is going to be um, very vital to how good you are at, at uh, playing the game. And also this sort of mental modeling, it happens on various time scales. So when you're planning the path, it's like, fraction of a second but here it's like a minute or something like that and uh, and the important thing to note though is that mental modeling playing around with your mental modeling that's gameplay just as much as shooting aliens in a spaceship is it's just that the feedback cycle is a lot slower when you're doing this sort of thing and but but it's there the, the feedback cycle is there so for instance take a game like chess when you're pl planning your move you have a mental model of what your opponent is uh, what he might do or she might do and you can sit like for minutes just playing around with this mental model and that's what chess is all about it's all about playing your mental model and chess is an extreme where it's all about mental modeling but all games unless it's like super rea it's only based on reactions but I'm, I'm, I'm sure like it's something like guitar hero doesn't i feel even something like guitar hero has like a tiny bit of uh, mental modeling uh, going around now um, mental modeling it arises as we interact with the game depending on what we see here and what we do it takes the sort of uh, lower level stuff and it builds upon that it's at a higher level and this is where it sort of gets interesting here because it's actually quite similar to how we define narrative so narrative and mental model they exist at this high level and sometimes they're even sort of the same thing so when you're playing with your mind model you're really playing directly in in some case at least uh, uh, with the with the narrative which for me is like that's a an insight uh, that that's really worth thinking about um Next up, oh, there was a last one. <laughs> you should open it a bit soon. Um, but um, in, in any case, what what's weird though, or what's annoying, is that this sort of uh, mental modeling it breaks down fairly. It's very hard to keep it coherent with the story that you want to tell. So in a horror game, for instance, the monsters start out really scary, but after a while they get less and less frightening, and then just become um, game objects. For instance, another example: take. Um, um, stealth game when you first come out uh, you come across a guard he, he you have no idea what he might do so your mind model is just exploding with possibilities of how he might react what he might do it's a very rich fantasy that you're building up in your head but then as you play the game a bit you, you understand that he has only like two patrol nodes he has three canned responses that he repeats over and over and over again and he like has two reactions or something like that and then he goes from this really amazing fantasy to being just a game object just a systemic object that you can use in order to gain your goals and if we want good interactive storytelling it's vital that we keep this rich fantasy going so why do we break down the fantasy in a way like this and it's because of the way that many games are designed in many games the core of the game is a sort of black box a system that is unknown to the player and the whole goal of the game is and, and really the core of the experience is to try and intuitively understand and master this uh, this system and this is something that i refer to as black box design so when you design a game uh, with this you first sort of in, in a very simplistic fashion you construct a black box and then you figure out the ways you can interact with this sort of black box so, and uh, ways that you then need to do is that you need to make sure that uh, when you interact with your black box it's uh, um, it's very you get feedback so that you can easily intuit and master this thing and it's very very important that the systems are at least somewhat transparent to the player and it's important that their mind model is sort of up to date with how the black the black box current states and its inner workings so, so you get a very sort of tight overlap with what the systems are actually like and even sort of worse is that you, you have um, 
a design where you want to have goals and where you want to have rewards that are all about figuring out how the underlying systems work. So the better you are at that, the better you are going to be at the game. And what this means is that the players are going to engage in a sort of optimization behavior. They're going to they're gonna do anything based on the mechanical gain and not really care about the sort of what's best for the narrative. So for instance, uh, a simple example would be you choose your character based on what's best for my gameplay and not, oh, what are my feelings towards her. So the end result is that we, when we play games like this, we tear down the fantasy. It starts out uh, like a very, as with the, with the guard and the stealth game, it starts out with this intricate uh, mind model, which is a very rich fantasy, and it just turns out uh, down into an abstract system. And if we want good storytelling, we need to make sure that there is a sort of tight overlap, that this doesn't happen. The fantasy needs to be, uh, um, there needs to be a detailed and uh, interesting fantasy going on. And uh, one way that uh, is very common um, as a sort of, this is how we're going to fix this uh, um, idea is that you make the system more complicated. And the basic idea then is that, so yeah, but if you figure out, if you figure out the underlying system, we're going to make them so complicated that there's still tons of narrative content there. They're, they're still, they're still going to act on all of these sort of small things that uh, would have made them into an abstract uh, object otherwise. Um, so, for instance, when you're if, if, when you if you're using this sort of method in order to fix the guard, he would have like super intelligent AI, lots and lots of animations. He would have uh, super good physics and and so forth. But I think this is a dead end because. The more complexity we add, the more the harder it becomes for us to control our creations. A great example of this is Half-Life 2 physics. Why do we not? Why do we not have uh, more games right now that has the same physics as Half-Life 2? And uh, and the uh, answer to that is it's because it's unpredictable. It's very hard to decide in your game when you can have like a box like blocking a door all of a sudden and stuff like that. And that's rigid body, uh, rigid body uh, physics simulation. It, it's not very complicated, just a few equations that the control of that. Think about if you have like really complex AI, then you're going to talk about unpredictability. Another example of this is uh, how uh, dialogue in RPGs have evolved over time. When you started out, it was just text. You can have tons of stuff happening in the dialogue. But then as we went on to, um, to audio, lip syncing, editing, uh, animation, lip syncing, whatnot, you'd have to like draw down on this. And, and stuff that was super simple in the past, like choosing your character's name, it's an almost an impossibility now. You, you can't really do that sort of thing. And, and I'm not implying here that uh, let's make all dialogue text. Uh, I'm just saying that the, when complexity rise in some part of the game, it tends to lower in some other part of the game. And that's an important uh, observation to make. And what I think we should do instead is that we should focus on keep our uh, keep our uh, system simple. That's how we can control and know what's going to happen. And instead, we move away from this sort of black box design and and uh, make sure that we can keep the fantasy alive instead. Most games they start out with really really good and and rich fantasy, but they you know, it, it collapses uh, after a while. And uh, then why not just, you know, we already have it there. Let's just try and figure out how to keep it instead of, you know, coming up with the uh, really crazy, um, uh, crazy complex things that you could be doing, but are probably not feasible. So one way to do this then is just, let's just cut interactions, which is basically what Telltale is doing. They're like, it's, uh, they only have interactions uh, at very specific points, so you can never like probe the underlying systems very well. But I feel that if we do this, we lose something that I think is crucial for the video game experience, what really sets us apart from uh, um, other media. That thing is presence. And presence is what makes uh, the guy in the amnesia crypt scream <laughs> um, and uh, uh, scream like crazy. 
Um, and uh, it's what makes us become immersed in these virtual worlds. So what is presence then? So in order to understand what presence is, we need to uh, check out the human brain a little bit. We like to think that our sense of self is something that is constant. It's, it's like this entity, uh, little homunculus sitting inside our head with the control panel, uh, um, uh, watching over our moves, um, that it's a, a fixed thing. But in reality, our sense of self is very, very malleable. It's, it can change uh, very easily. And there's a very nice experiment to, to do that. And you can try this at home later on. Um, all you need is a hammer and a rubber hand. Um, so you take your subject or friend, let's be scientific here and say subject. Um, then it's much easier to do uh, to all the nasty stuff. Um, so you, you make them put up uh, their hand on a table and next to the hand you put the rubber glove, then you put on some screen so they cannot see the real hand and you start stroking their real hand and the rubber hand at the same at the same point at the same time and after a little bit your subject um, will will report that uh, oh it, it feels like uh, the rubber hand is my own and that's when you bring up the hammer and slam it down on the rubber hand and you're gonna see how they Retract! Don't 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 slam down on the real hand because that's that ruins <laughs> ruins friendships. Um, <laughs> and and you're gonna like pull back their their real hand like as an unconscious reflex. Uh, um, uh, when you, when you just as if you you had uh, tried to hit hit a real hand, which I hope you didn't. And uh, you can also try this in a slightly more subtle fashion. You can uh, you can take a, a knife and threaten the rubber hand, and then you measure the galvanic skin response, which is palm sweat, basically. And the result is identical to threatening the real hand. And if you're wondering, yes, there are researchers who do this. There's a Swedish weird guy who like make uh, um, people have out of body experience and that sort of stuff. And he's like normal routine is like, oh, I'm gonna threaten some rubber hands today, um, <laughs> which, which is sort of an interesting way to do your living. Um, <clears throat> um, so uh, what happens is that, is that this continuous stroking, it changes the body image and it changes this in such a way that, uh, that I mean, an, an unconscious action like palm sweat or just uh, pulling back your arm, that uses your new body image. And it's all because of this feedback loop that happens as you're stroking, as you're stroking the finger, you also, uh, the, the, your subject is also watching the finger being stroked and there's a sort of feedback loop that says, oh yeah, 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 yeah. this is what, what, what's going on there. That's, that's my real hand there. And, and it just, you know, breaks your brain a little bit. And, uh, and and this this feedback loop can then obviously um, be broken. Uh, but uh, the, the important part here is that what makes our our sense of self is our like current state of perception. And what is true for the self is also true for um, the the world out there. Like. Um, <clears throat> We like to also think that like the world here is exactly like we see it, but I mean colors is just our our eyes way of interpreting uh, wavelengths of light hitting like our three different receptors uh, uh, in our eyes and uh, like shapes and stuff like that don't don't really exist either. Um, it's just stuff we, we make up in our heads. Um, so what's really happening when we feel that you know walking around in this real world being our real selves we really are our virtual selves walking around in a virtual representation um, of the of the outside world inside our heads um, which, which is uh, which is a bit scary but uh, don't don't try and think <laughs> think about it too much um, so but what what ma what makes this real and not an hallucination is this feedback loop going on your constant state uh, your constant perception uh, perception is constant is evaluating the current state of the world so for instance if I were to like kick kick this uh, podium like so um, you know I hear sounds and my my 
feet, oh sorry, I'm, I'm breaking up the equipment here. Um, my feet, it stops, and if I kick really hard, it's gonna hurt in my toes, and that's gonna tell me that, oh yeah, 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 the, the podium, it exists, and my feet, yeah, they're, they're, they're there at the bottom of my legs. Okay, so everything's cool. Um, and and, and you, you know that there's something out there, and, this, and, and there is uh, this uh, sort of feedback loop. And this feedback loop is exactly the same thing that you get when you're playing a game. So um, when you're when you're sh checking out uh, a medium that's not uh, video games, you only get stuff happening in one direction. When you're watching a movie, it's just sending light and noises to you. You can never send something back to it, so it can never really have any greater change on your uh, uh, on your sense of self. But a game can. And uh, because of this feedback loop where you're giving the, uh, the game some input and then getting some input back, and that creates a connection between your sense of self and the world inside the game. And that's, that's exactly what makes grown men scream like little girls when they play horror games. Um, so, 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 so there's a very, very um, uh, potent thing happening. And I think that if we want to do uh, um, storytelling in video games, we need to have this this in. This is like what I feel is one of the biggest things. I mean, they can literally, like really in a literal sense, um, transfer us into other worlds. So this brings us to, this sets up some pretty uh, nice goals for interactive storytelling, um, the, the talk so far. So we want the mental model and the narrative to, uh, to overlap, and that's all. And we want to keep the mental model rich and vivid, and we want to build up and uh, maintain a sense uh, of uh, presence. Obviously, there's other stuff here as well that we want. We want to have good gameplay and stuff like that. But that sort of stuff we also want in other games. This is stuff that I feel is crucial for interactive storytelling, and uh, it's also uh, stuff that is is uh, like specific to uh, to uh, interactive storytelling. You can have it, of course, in other games, but it becomes a little more specific. So now we're done with the theory department here. So let's move on on how to like how do we achieve this thing? What what sort of rules do we have to? Um, aligned to. And I'm just going to list what I feel is the sort of five core elements of uh, interactive storytelling that, that you need to do in order to satisfy the goals that uh, were just set up. First of all, it's focus on storytelling. It's I mean, it's trivial, but but it's also it's rare um, in video games that storytelling is your focus. Um, if if you make a, an interactive, if you want to do interactive storytelling, your ga game must be about telling a specific story. And no, that remember now that does not mean that we want to have a very specific plot. It doesn't throw out that the player has agency or choices. It doesn't throw out gameplay. It just means that the features you have in your game need to be coherent with the story elements that you have. It's, it, it, it's just that. And the game cannot be about stacking gems. It cannot be about solving puzzles. It cannot be about shooting bad guys. It can contain those things. That's not an issue. But it cannot have those things as its primary thing. Next up, most of the time is spent playing. As we have, uh, have seen now during this lecture, that the really cool stuff like mind models and presence, it, it happens as you play. That's, that's when the magic happens. So we want to have games where you play as much as possible. Next up, we need to have interactions that make narrative sense. Um, obviously, we want to interact a lot, but if the interactions do not align with the story, they're, they're just going to mess up. So we need to make sure that we overlap the mental model the player has on the game systems with, uh, with the sort of narrative that we want. Next up, we do not want any repetition. As I said before, the black box design is what tears the fantasy down. and. Uh, a repetition is a core feature of black box design. That's how you do mastery. That's how you do intu uh, intuitive learning of figuring out how the system works. And uh, we want to keep the fantasy alive. So therefore, it's very important that uh, we, 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 we do not rep repeat, our, our, uh, repeat ourselves uh, too much. Um, there's another reason for not doing this as well, and it has to do with story pacing. Um, 
it's very rarely that it uh, boosts the narrative somehow by killing 100 bad guys in a row. It's it's very rarely that it, um, it makes the story the storytelling better. And and uh, and important though is that just because we don't repeat ourselves doesn't mean that the game has to be some sort of warrior style game where you change the gameplay all over you can still have simple gameplay mechanics but the gameplay mechanics uh, uh, you need to vary them how you use them limbo is an excellent example of how how, how this is done one caveat though is that in order to get a, a good mental model you need to have a certain amount of repetition otherwise the player will not get like a proper understanding so it's a little bit fuzzy exactly how much it's 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 not clear ex it's it, that repetition is not like inherently bad it's just that you have to be careful about it um um no repetition i said minimal repetition i think i said before so no repetition is not minimal repetition it's a better way of putting it um but no major progression blocks we want the player to constantly think about storytelling they cannot be caught up in uh, just oh i just want to progress and that's exactly what happens when you come across an obstacle that is very annoying uh, to get across that might involve a rubber ducky or a cat in a mustache or something like that um <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, so you want to avoid those things because what happens is that the player is going to go into optimization mode and just uh, try and, uh, and, and and try and uh, you know for the you're just gonna oh I'm just gonna see it as an abstract system I'm just gonna break it in whichever way I can to make make sure that I can progress and uh, yes so, so so these are the, the things and. Uh, uh, just, just, just it should be clear, but I'm just saying it is that these things are obviously for games that are about storytelling. I mean, if if you're making Super Meat Boy, repetition is is good. It's like that's what the game is about. This is uh, there are like this does not exclude other games from being made. This is just storytelling. Just making clear. And but but with that said, um, I think that these these elements are. They're not strange. I think they come up pretty intuitively, but it's very hard to find games that have them all. I've, I've sort of gone through and made lists and uh, tried and uh, and uh, figure out how many has them. And depending on how you define them, it's very few or none. So um, th there's not a lot of them that happening. There is sections in games that has it. I think that the giraffe scene from Last of Us is is, is a good example when like everything comes together in a very very nice uh, fashion but there is obviously uh, some some hurdle in making a full game uh, having all of these elements so what I think is uh, the problem of trying to do this thing in practice is is that many people like to solve storytelling uh, like at one point I'm just gonna I'm just gonna like have this idea and then like everything's everything about the game is just gonna com come together and I think that a more practical approach is that you can start with something that does not satisfy it all and then you can build layers upon layers and uh, until you get it an iterative method until you get to where you want to be in terms of storytelling and uh, this sort of method is something that we used for our upcoming game Soma um, and it's a uh, method that's called for layers. It's something that I um, collaborated with uh, Adrian Schimelesch from um, The Astronauts. Uh, um, they released uh, recently The Vanishing of Ethan Carter which also uh, based a lot of its uh, gameplay design on, on this approach. And the approach is that, first of all, you want to uh, make the game into scenes. In most games already are scenes, but I think it's important to think about it as such. It can be a puzzle, it can be an enemy encounter, and so forth. And then the first step is adding the gameplay. And there's, there are three basic rules that you need to uh, follow in, in, in order to, uh, to, to make this good. First of all, there needs to be coherency. So coherency with the, uh, with the story and stuff like that that then you need to have some uh, um, some form of streamlining it's just you don't want, want it to be co too convoluted um, th that the puzzle is uh, um, if you want to turn on the TV in, in an adventure game so you shouldn't uh, you know 20 minutes later you shouldn't be looking in a ravine for the last battery or you know making your own electricity uh, or, or, or stuff like that um, and the third thing uh, that you want to think about is um, 
is that there needs to be a sense of accomplishment that you can't just go go and press a button or something like that it, it's not going to be very interesting to play that game so so those sort of sort of things oh just just a sort of uh warning here on this i'm going to go through fairly quickly on uh, this four layers first I, I, I could talk a lot if you want to hear more you can like catch me after the talk so i'm going through it fairly quickly um and, and i have there's online uh, stuff for it as well um anyways back back to the talk next layer is uh, the layer called narrative uh, narrative goal and uh, what you do not want or what you often get from just adding the gameplay is that the player is just driven by progress. Why do you solve the puzzle? Because that's how the game continues. You want to have some form of motivation that is in the narrative, that is that is a story bit uh, for the player. And what you also get when you, when you have this is that if you have a, a, a narrative motivation, when you complete that you're often, you, you're like, uh, you, you're gonna get a, a narrative reward. You, you, you often get that, that sort of thing for free if you design that thing. Next up is layer three, which is called narrative background. And narrative background is that when you just have the gameplay and go through with it, you, you're just gonna do stuff that perhaps doesn't have very much to do with the with actual narrative. So you wanna sprinkle out story stuff as the player goes through with this normal uh, um, normal gameplay stuff uh, in order to uh, get a thicker sense of uh, storytelling going on. Finally, we have mental modeling. Talked a lot about mental modeling already. Um, in this design approach, it's about finding elements for a whole part, uh, for the whole game or parts of the game where the player is meant to think in a certain a certain manner of, of the game's world. For instance, in a detective game, it makes sense for the player to be, to know that, oh, the details uh, are very important for solving the crime and stuff like that. Um, or in a horror game, it can be that uh, a monster might pop up at any moment. Then and what this does is that it influences the way that the player thinks and traverses uh, through the environment. So going back to what I said before about uh, Rainbow Six, um, when you had the mental model that you could be shot at any time, you, you thought twice before entering an unknown room and you start thinking about where might the hostiles be, where might they be hiding, might there be one in the closet and so forth. Um, so so that's, that's what you want from that. Important here to note is that this is not just a sort of waterfall method where you just go through the layers and then you're done. You're constantly going to jump back and forth between this. Um, when you have constructed your gameplay and then your narrative goal, you might have to change the gameplay, then the marriage, your background, and you have to change the goal, blah, 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 and, and you just go back and forth a lot. So it's a very, very iterative uh, um, method. Um, a problem with the method that we have uh, gotten from uh, working with it in Soma is that the the design becomes very intricate everything is connected to everything else so you can't just like rip something out and put something else in there it's 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 it it, it becomes very hard to change stuff at a certain time or just you know plug in a new puzzle sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't um so but i feel that if you have a design approach where like changing store where changing gameplay changes the story then i mean that's a good sign that you're you're doing something right in terms of interactive storytelling now i'm going to show a bit from our upcoming game soma exclusive clip um, <laughs> um uh, it's never seen before um of how all this come together so i'm just going to do some uh, i'm going to talk a bit afterwards on, on what you have seen a bit on how the design approach worked and all the, all the stuff um but first some background so um the, the game opens up pretty early on in the game and uh, the game's protagonist simon he's at this weird facility and uh, he's not sure why he's there he he has he might have some some clues but he wants really really bad to to find out wh where the hell he is and uh, he also know that there are some things here that may not be very friendly. Thank you. 
can you hear me? So that's it. So I'm just gonna go over a bit uh, the yeah, that's it. I'm just gonna go over a bit on uh, the different design stuff that's uh, that happened there. So first of all, the sort of basic gameplay that we had here is crawl through tunnel, enter room. There's a locked door. Turn on the power, exit door. The, the player, like, short love this, the player can exit the door. And that's sort of the basic gameplay. And uh, honestly, if, if uh, this was amnesia, I would have, like, left it at that. So, <laughs> um, But what, what do we have here? First of all, we have a mental model that there's some sort of danger here. And there's stuff we do. When you crawl through the tunnel, you're gonna, you see these lights. You know that there is some sort of presence here that's, uh, that's dangerous. You're setting the player up that okay i'm gonna be on my alert here and as you might have seen also is that there was a sort of visual effect when the the lights passed by so then later on when the player enters the room they see that there's a robot lying on the floor they're not sure is this a hostile one is this like uh, can i go close to it so you're gonna we want the player to like you know have have used their mind model to the fullest and think about what uh, um, what might happen if they go close to it and also as they go close to it you, we have the sort of same distortion effect playing so i'm not sure if one notice it but i think hopefully like subtly you're gonna you're gonna feel that shit 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 and she shouldn't perhaps go near this thing um then also as you uh, check here you're gonna see the the computer screen and it says that i'm not sure if you if you saw it but it says that there's a, a com relay is, is is broken and you know it needs more power now you have a narrative reason for starting up the power because the, the power is down and you want to figure out what what what, what the hell is happening perhaps you need to contact someone and um and then also what we have is that we have a sort of um, a narrative background going on here because the puzzle itself is pretty simplistic. Um, but uh, there's this robot sucking energy or something out of the computer, making it uh, unusable to you. So you need to pull out these tentacles or what, whatever they are. And uh, then it starts talking. And then ha stuff happens as you're just going through with, uh, with the steps uh, needed in order to solve the puzzle. And also there's a sort of in very simple insight, but it's just that, oh, these tentacles are blocking me from using a computer. Then, oh, this creature is sucking energy from it, perhaps just giving giving rise to more things that have a narrative connection to it and then finally as you as you get as you get the power up you also get the narrative reward and that you do get up some contact with the person that's not the creepy robot lying on the floor um so so, so that's basically it um just gonna wrap, wrap things up a little bit here um so uh first of all um what I want everyone to go away with here, if, if you just, you know, forget everything else, you know, I'm he just stood there and talked about the Danish games or something like that. Um, you, you should you should know that story does not equal plot. So if you just go with that, I'm going to be like super happy. Ne um, next up is also that this is not, I don't think that this is like the final theory on interactive storytelling. This is just a start. I think there's tons more to explore here i'm just scratching the surface of it I'm, I'm 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 positively sure but i hope that i've built up concepts that are uh, that are usable to you and enable you to think more about this to to think about it in a more productive and helpful way and that's i've inspired some of you to, yeah hell i'm gonna try and see if i can, uh, can can do something with this then i'd also be very happy and also just thinking about storytelling in a non like very classical way that it's just some plotted thing that is that's in the way for the gameplay that's it's actually something that you can make very much the same uh, the same thing final thing which i think is super important too is that going along with this even if you just oh i'm just gonna use this model um or try and uh, go even further with it is that I don't think there are many of the hurdles that awaits us are tech related. It's design stuff. It's stuff that we can do. I mean, we don't have to wait for some sort of breakthrough in technology like computers that are, you know, super intelligent or whatnot. This is stuff that you can do right here, right now, and it's just a matter of start doing it. Um, and I think that's sort of something that uh, you want to keep in mind. That's it. Um, so um, I've collected it from another talk. I collect a bunch of resources. If you want to check out, if you thought that uh, I wasn't thorough enough or something like that, I've written tons of it there. Um, there's my Twitter. That's my mail. Thanks for listening.